Okay, greetings, comrades. Can thou hear me? Greetings, greetings. Thank you, thank you. Suka. It's good, I like this. Solidarity. <clears throat> all right, so hopefully you all had a decent weekend after you turned your module in. When will the module be graded? Uh, that's a great question, which depends on several people all grading it, so not really easy to say. Uh, probably before the next module, though. Uh, yes, Ali. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've seen someone else do that. Right? I knew that was coming. <laughs> It's, it's good though, it's good though. Okay, so today we are moving on to, um, we're, we're basically going to define a definite integral. So last time we talked about antiderivatives, and then this is going to seem like a, a totally disconnected subject, um, approximating areas under the curves using definite integrals. But then we'll see how they like, we'll come back together in a few sections and we'll learn something called the fundamental theorem of calculus, which will which we'll bring it all back home. All right, so so we're just going to look at approximating areas under curves using rectangles. So this just probably won't seem too much like calculus to you until we get to the fundamental theorem. All right, so the first question says, suppose a car is traveling at a constant rate of 60 miles per hour for two hours and then 40 miles per hour uh, for another two hours. All right, how, fa how far did the car travel? Sketch the graph of the velocity, and then how does the distance travel relate to the area under the graph? Okay, so this is not too bad. If I'm going 60 miles per hour for two hours, how far did I travel? So the first leg of the tour. Good, 120, right? And then on the second leg of the tour, I went 40 miles per hour for another two. So how far did I travel in the second one? 80. Good. Apparently there was no, no, no bathroom breaks. All right, so this is just 120 plus 80, 200 miles. All right, so how, what does the graph of their velocity look like, though? All right, so we're sketching the graph of the velocity. That's true as well. If you stop, you're not moving at all. All right. So what would so for the first two hours, what would the graph of the velocity look like? If I'm just going at 60 miles per hour, just a constant. Would it look like a quadratic function, a horizontal line? Good. It's just a constant. OK, and then for the next two hours, I'm going 40. how fancy we are now with our Microsoft Windows Surface Go. All right, so what is, what is the area of this first rectangle? 
we have come very far. That's true. Good. 120, right? Because it's 60 units tall and two units wide. And the area of the second rectangle will be 80, right? Because it's 40 units tall and two units wide. All right, so the distance traveled is the same thing as the area under the graph. Okay, so the area under the velocity graph gives us the position. Okay, so that's another way to think about a relationship between um, position and velocity. All right, so let's see, let's look at the next question, which is similar. Um, uh, UIC Motorsports designed and manufactured with the 2014, designed and manufactured with the 2014 Formula car, a four cylinder space frame car that weighs less than 205 kilograms. Wow. All right. On a first test ride, uh, while accelerating, the velocity was measured for a 10 second period every two seconds. All right. So the car is accelerating and we're measuring its velocity every two seconds. All right. So let's approximate how fast it traveled based on this velocity data. It'll basically do the same thing that we did here. All right. And I'll explain sort of what right and left endpoints mean. I guess this is the car. <laughs> all right, so so let's let, let's plot these points on a graph. All right, so zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on. All right, I might have to zoom in here. Okay, and you can see that um, every two seconds it's speeding up. The velocity itself is increasing, but the rate at which the velocity is increasing is decreasing, right? It goes from 20 to 30, so a difference of 10, then from 30 to 38, distance of, or a difference of 8, 38 to 44, so a difference of 6, and so on, and then 4 and 2. All right, so at zero, it was already going 20, apparently. At two, it's going 30. At four, it's going 38. At six, it's going 44. At eight, it's going 48. And then at 10, it's going 50. Okay, so let's assume it, it's a, the, it's changing smoothly. So you could kind of like imagine what the velocity curves like curve looks like by um, by connecting these dots smoothly. Okay, so we're going to measure the area under this curve by using rectangles. Yes, very smooth. This is this is the peak of education technology. Yeah. 
we are quite fortunate. Yeah, same to be honest. All right, so left endpoints means we'll, we're, we'll basically think of all of these intervals. And we'll want to like make a rectangle for each one, take the area of the rectangle, and then add them up. And that will be our, um, our approximation to the distance the car traveled. All right, so if I'm using left endpoints, for example, my first rectangle will go from 0 to 2 on the time axis. And I'll use the leftmost point. So at 0, the velocity is 20. So a left, using a left endpoint for this rectangle. Oh, no. What have I done? Ruined. Okay, so we measure this using left rectangles. Okay, so we'll measure the area under the curve by using rectangles. And you can imagine that if we had more data points, we could use more and more rectangles. And as you let the number of rectangles go to infinity, it gets closer and closer to the exact area under the curve. All right, so we're just going to look at the area of each of these. So we're going to get under the curve. with these five rectangles. Check my mic, huh? Can you hear me? Um, really, let me, okay, okay, good, good, I take no blame. All right, so what is, what is the area of the first rectangle? So the rectangle one, rectangle two, rectangle three. Good, 40, right? It's it's its height is 20 and its width is 2. All right, what about the second rectangle? Good. And the third, someone other than Jared. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then, so the last one, 44, will be 44 times 2, and then 48 times 2. Okay, so this is 40 plus 60 plus 76 plus 88 plus 96. Okay, so what does that all add up to? Technically correct. Okay, two people wrote the same thing, so I'm going to assume it's correct. 
hypothesis and some validation. Also, it is at least two. All right, so we got 360. So is this a is this an underestimate or an overestimate of the actual area or distance the car traveled? Good, under, right? Because you can see there's like missing space. So the area of the car, the distance the car traveled is the area under the velocity curve, right? And we're approximating it using these rectangles because we don't know any calcul enough calculus yet to, to, to answer the actual question, right? But obviously we're missing a lot of area. There's all this sort of, let's see what color I could use. All right, we're missing some area. So we're underestimating the curve here. We're underestimating the area under the curve. OK, so I'm, I'm going to break out into groups, and I want y'all to come up with the right endpoint approximation. All right, so we'll do this for just like five minutes. The right side possibly would be an overestimate. It's good to draw, draw a picture, and you can kind of tell from the picture. Okay, this is on um, Blackboard, by the way, in the same spot normally is.
Okay, so let me break you out of your quarantine. <laughs> mm -hmm. A round of applause for group five. Probably know if you were in group five, so. <clears throat> How do y'all get profile pictures? I really need to change the, the, the screen sleep settings on this thing. Nope, we're back. Okay, so so right in points means we'll, we'll break up the same intervals, but instead of using the leftmost point from the interval, we'll use the rightmost point. All right, so uh, it's kind of bad form to do this on the same graph, but unfortunately we have no choice. All right, so for example, for the rightmost rectangle, rather than using the y coordinate at 8, we use the y coordinate at 10. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, Sam. All right. So now the area, now when we compute the area, we'll use the right endpoint. So for example, the first rectangle has a height of 30 rather than 20. All right. So you have 30 times 2 and 38 times 2, 44 times 2, 
48 times 2, and then finally 50 times 2. So 60 plus 76 plus 88 plus 96 plus 100. Okay, so what does that come out to be? Hmm. Can't tell if joking or not. Was it good math? Okay, it is indeed 420. 360 no scope. All right. So is this an overestimate or an underestimate? Okay, good. It's an overestimate, right? You can tell really just by looking at the picture. All right, so this is an overestimate. All right, so these approximations are called Riemann sums, named after Bernard Riemann. The original Bernie bro. All right, so we'll do, we'll do the same thing basically with an actual function, all right? So if we have, uh, we want to approximate the area under x squared, all right, on the interval from 0 to 8. So what, is, what does x squared look like on the interval from 0 to 8? Okay, so we'll use a left point, a left end point approximation and n equals 2. So n here is the number of rectangles that we use. All right, so if I use, um, if I use two rectangles, And I'm using a left endpoint, what will be the height of the first rectangle? I am recording. Okay, so this is the function uh, x squared, but all right, so I'm going from zero to eight. So the first rectangle will go will be between zero and four, right? What's the height of the left endpoint? Zero. Thank you. All right. From zero to four, like you like the first interval is zero to four, the second interval is four to eight. So if I'm using the left endpoint, I use I take the left number. So when I plug zero into the function, I just get zero. All right, so the first rectangle, so we'll call this L2 for left and two rectangles. All right, the first rectangle has height zero and width four. What will be the height of the next rectangle? Good, 16, right? You're, you're plugging 16 into the function, or sorry, you're plugging four into the function. Four is the left end point of the second interval, all right? So it'll be four times 16, four because that's the width. All 
All right, so this is just ends up being 64. All right, so it's not really a good approximation, is it? All right, if this is basically all the area that we measured. Okay, but as you use more and more uh, more rectangles, you'll get better and better. All right, so let's see. So let's use right endpoint approximation and n equals four. Okay, so I'm going to draw the graph again. Uh, I don't know, Emiliano. It's very touching. All right. So, um, so we have from zero to eight, and we want to break this into four intervals. Oh, thank you. All right. So the first, so so we'll break this into inter or like or how how wide will each interval be? if we break the zero to eight into four. Two, right? So I'll go from zero to two, two to four, four to six, and then six to eight. Okay, and if I, so the first rectangle will span like the width from zero to two on the x-axis. So this will be R4. So R means right. The subscript four refers to the number of rectangles. All right. So what will the height of the first rectangle be if I use if I'm using um, the zero to two interval and the right endpoint? Good, good, exactly. It's four. <laughs> the height, the height is um, the y coordinate, right? Two is the endpoint that you plug into the function, all right? And then the height is four. Okay, so the first rectangle will be width two, and height four. So remember, this is a right endpoint. Okay, so I want you all to I want you all to take it and try to finish this problem, finish the approximation.
Okay, so let's see. So it can be good to sometimes maybe like just make a, a table. So the x coordinates that I'm using for the right endpoints of each interval will be 2, 4, 6, and 8. Right? And height will be the just the height of the curve at each of these points. All right, so 2, f of x would be 4. For 4, it would be 16. For 6, it would be 36. And for 8, it would be 64. All right, the width of each rectangle is always 2. All right. So these are the heights. And then the width in this case is always 2. So 2 plus, times 4 plus times 16, no, not 4 times 16, sorry, 2 times 16, plus 2 times 36, plus 2 times 64. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, right, so that's, you can factor the two out from all of them, you can add the heights together and then just multiply by 2, um, and then 64 plus 36 is 100, 16 plus 4 is 20, so the, the sum of all the heights is 120, and then if you multiply that by 2, you get 240. Okay, and is this an over or an underestimate? Good, and you, you can tell by looking at the pictures, all right? It's not true that like the right endpoints is always an overestimate. It depends on if the function's increasing or decreasing. For example, if I had a function that was decreasing on some interval, and I use right endpoints, then I would be underestimating. Okay, whereas if I use less left endpoints, I would be overestimating. So it depends on whether your function is increasing or decreasing. And you don't really need to like memorize anything like that. You can always just sort of think about what the picture looks like. All right, so finally, uh, we'll use midpoint approximation, okay, using the same amount of intervals, all right? So let's see. Okay, so now, so we're breaking um, 0 to 8 up into 4 intervals. So the intervals are like the same, like 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, and 6 to 8. When you use left endpoints, you just take the left most endpoint. So you'd use 0, 2, 4, and 6. When you use right endpoints, you use the right endpoint of each like sub-interval. So you'd use 2, 4, 6, and 8. For midpoints, you take the middle point in each sub-interval, right? So our first subinterval goes between 0 and 2. So the midpoint is 1. All right? Um, between 2 and 4. So the second like rectangle will go will be drawn between 2 and 4. What will the, what is the midpoint between 2 and 4? Good. Just 3. All right, and it and now you can kind of probably guess where this goes. So between four and six, the midpoint is five. Between six and eight, the midpoint is seven. All right. So now I measure the height at each of these points. So this is where the height of the rectangle will come from. I'll plug each of these points into the um, quadratic. So there will be one, nine, twenty-five, and forty-nine. Okay, so let's see. So what does this really look like? So 
So now we're measuring the height. at each of these midpoints. OK, so now it's not really it's less clear whether we're overestimating or underestimating. And often, um, this is a better approximation than, than the right or left in points. OK, because there are some spots where we're going a little bit over the curve, and there are some spots where we're going a little bit below the curve. All right, so this will be the sum. So we would call this M4 for midpoint. And the number of rectangles is still 4. The width is always 2. So these rectangles will be, or the area under these rectangles will be 2 times 1 plus 2 times 9 plus 2 times 25 plus 2 times 49. So let's see. So this is 2 plus 18 plus 50 plus 98. So 2 plus 18 is 20, 20 plus 50. Um, is 70, 70 plus 98 is 168. Okay, good. All right, so uh, let's see. So we have to move a little bit quick through these last couple things. Um, so the next one says that a train goes east at 60 miles per hour for two hours and then goes west at three miles per hour for two hours. So say that east is the positive direction and west is negative. Hey, comrade. All right, and this will be a graph of velocity versus time. <laughs> All right, so um, if we're going east for 60 miles per hour for two hours, then my velocity curve will just be a horizontal line at 60. OK, and then if I go 40 miles per hour west for two hours, what would how would I graph that on the velocity curve if I'm moving in the opposite direction at 40 miles per hour? Good, negative. So my velocity for the next two hours I think of as negative 40. All right. So if I want to think about how far I traveled, well, if I traveled 60 miles per hour for two hours, then I went 120 miles in the eastern direction. And then if I traveled backwards for 40 miles per hour for two hours, then I went back 40 times 2. So this is 120 minus 80, which is just 40. So this is the total distance traveled, all right? And you can think about this as the net area under this curve. Okay, so in this case, area above the x-axis you take to be positive, 
an area below the x-axis you take to be negative. All right, we can express this using, using the following notation. All right, so this is something called like a definite integral. All right, this, this, like this notation here, you read as the integral from a to b of the function f. And what that evaluates to is the net area under the curve between a and b. Okay, so this picture here and this computation gives us the area under the curve of the velocity graph between zero, but uh, over time from zero to four. And this is 40. All right, so now let's let's use this notation to try to answer some of these questions. All right, so here we're given a graph. This is a graph of uh, the function f. All right, so going from 0 to 2, so like this first part, a, this means net area under the curve. from 0 to 2, all right? So here's 0, here's 2. The area under the curve is referring to this area. So it's like the area between the curve and the x-axis, I should say. All right, does anyone remember? So sometimes with certain pictures, you can do this with geometry. Uh, does anybody remember what the area of a triangle is? Nope, Pythagorean probably has something to do with it. Good, one half base times height. So the area of a triangle is one half base times height. And if I'm looking at this as a triangle, it has a base of width two and its height is also two. All right, so we just get two. Good. Indeed, we'd have to find out what the what the angle was. All right. So part B, like this is the definite integral from two to four of the same function. So now this is the net area between two and four. All right, so it's measuring this this red area. All right, so that's half of a circle, right? What is what is the radius um, of that circle? One, right? The center would be at three, and then the radius would just be one. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. So in this case, since this is only half of a circle, we just take one half of that area. All right, and would this area, would I take this to be positive or negative actually? Negative, right? Because it lies below the x-axis. So you just get negative pi over two. Okay. Sorry, keeping it a little extra, but then the last question, um, so zero to zero. So this is basically saying like, what is the area under zero? <laughs> All right. So, so what do y'all think this is? Like, like all these other ones are an interval, right? I go from, I go from two to four or from zero to two and I look at the area under the curve. What if I just plug, plug in the same point to the top and bottom? Good, yeah, right, zero, right? I can't have an area under a single point. There would be no, there's no width, right? 
So this is just zero. And then more generally, any point, like zero, there's nothing really special about zero here. If I take the definite integral of any function from A to A for any constant A, I'll get zero. True. All right, so that's, um, so that's all for today. Uh, we'll be continuing this sort of train of thought next time as well. We'll look more into Riemann sums. Um, we'll get a little more rigorous with them, and then, and then we'll sort of see how this relates to antiderivatives next. Yeah. OK. Um, all right, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, I'll have office hours in the main room in like eight minutes. Yeah, the recordings are available if you go if you just like click on um, black like online classrooms and then in the top left there's like three horizontal lines which are a menu bar and you should be able to see there should be some like option to click on re find recordings or something and it'll be like say Sean Rogers lectures on 413 or something like that. Uh, yes, every week. All right, see you guys.